Uh, to DC 207. Uh, my name is Ben. I am the host of this event. I um, and also your coordinator for things. So uh, thank you so much. Tonight we have a, a, a series of lightning talks. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for the suggestion and everybody for contributing. That's uh, super helpful. I've been having, <clears throat> as just mentioned, I've been having some trouble finding folks uh, to uh, give presentations on content. So I really appreciate um, the help. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and kick off the first talk today uh, with, um, we have Scott Ellis on the line um, and he's gonna be talking about InMap um, and the scripting engine, NIC. And I'll let you take it away. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm gonna share my screen. So can everyone see the slide? Not yet. About now. No. Nope. My hand. How's that? There you go. Okay. Better. Got to hit hit the share button. Okay. Uh, so I've been writing uh, some nmap scripts at work. And um, unfortunately, I can't show all those, but uh, it, it's kind of, I mean, I've been an NMAP user for a long time, but I've kind of always just like noticed the scripts are running, but never really got into how you actually go about writing them yourself. So these are stolen from another uh, presentation. I guess this group probably doesn't have to uh, be told what NMAP is, probably familiar with it. Uh, but it got started in 1997 and the scripting engine was added in 2007. And really it was to enhance the functionality of NMAP. Uh, primarily, you know, service detection, brute forcing and fuzzing attacks and actually uh, exploitation uh, that you can do from NMAP now. So the scripts are written in Lua. You can write them in C or C++, but everybody writes them in Lua, right? Uh, it's nice because NMAP has a, as you would expect, it has a pretty powerful uh, networking engine, multi-threaded, cross-platform. You can do uh, raw packet stuff. Uh, so that's pretty useful. And uh, when you write your scripts, you have access to all of that. So NMAP comes with about 600 scripts now. Every release comes with uh, a pretty good chunk of new scripts. Uh, and there's a bunch of support libraries that your scripts can use things like HTTP, SSH, SSL, uh, SMB. So you can handle all those protocols pretty trivially in your scripts and I'll have some examples later. So just for people who are not familiar with NMAP, let me just show a few things, all right? And just to keep it simple, I'm just gonna stay on my local network and uh, just a few hosts. All right. And also to keep all the scripts fast. So this is one of the longest ones, but all right. So this is typical and map stuff, right? You get hosts and you get ports and the status of the ports. And if we can identify these uh, services are just taken out of a database file. Right. So it's not really doing anything uh, that fancy. You can run scripts by passing a command. And now this will run just a subset of the scripts, the default scripts that NMAP provides. Uh, when you run like dash A and map, uh, you'll get these same scripts. Sorry, it's taking a little bit longer than I expected. Let me slow it down a little bit or speed it up. Just going after one host. All right, whenever you see this, these uh, pipes 
up and down. These are Nmap scripts. It's the script name and then the output, whatever the script wants to output. Okay, and so we'll get some more examples here. Uh, some of the things that I do pretty uh, frequently. Uh, let's look at HTTP. So now I'm going to spec I'm specifying scripts explicitly instead of just taking uh, what MF wants to give me by default. Okay. So for example, headers head, title, uh, we have SSL stuff, we have so I'm just trying to give you a little bit of feel for what you can do with nmap scripts. All right. Uh, let's look at SSH. So we have public key and passwords enabled there. Uh, compared to say a machine like this, different algorithms, uh, depending on the, the server, how the server set up. Okay, so that's just a feel for it. So how do you write a script? And then that. There's really just four things that you have to do when you write a script. You have to provide a description. That's what shows up when you run help on a script, which I didn't show you, and I'll show you in a second. You have to specify the category, uh, whether it's a safe script, uh, uh, the type of script it is. Execution rule when you want it to run, and then the action is where you actually do your work. So these are callbacks. So descriptions, just what happens when you run your script. You can, uh, let me give you an example. So this will detect if your machine's vulnerable to uh, eternal blue, something like that. Uh, the category. So Nmap will, you can query it. But not, so these are all the scripts that are in the default category. And then there's like uh, exploit, so like that. So you can look at you can look in the directories if you want to to find scripts. I'm trying to go fast here because I want to show an example of writing some scripts. Uh, execution. So there's four times four places where you can tell your script to run. You can tell it to run uh, before any of the scans, the nmap scans. It's a pre rule Post rule once after all the scans have been run. You can have it run, your script run once per host, and then you can have it run uh, based on a port, particular port. Uh, it can be all ports or it can be just a particular port. So I'm going to start writing some scripts here. 
uh, and we can see them in action. So this is a very simple script. It has a description, author category, the pre-rule. This time I'm with the pre-rule, it's going to run before any other scans run. And all I'm going to do is output something, right? So if I run this, I've already loaded it. So uh, OK, because I didn't provide any targets, and because it's a pre-rule script, I don't need any targets. It just showed up. If I were to add some targets here, you see it still only runs once at the very start. If I wanted to run after all the scripts, and this is important because these, like a pre-rule script, this is something I would do in real life. A pre-rule script could do something like a, uh, a broadcast and find out all the clients that are talking back and report. And you could put them into a list of targets for the rest of this, the NMAP run to process. Uh, similarly, a post-rule script, you could collect the data. So while NMAP is running, it's building up a database of results that every script contributes to. So in your post script, a post-rule, you could say process the final results. So pre-rule, you can load targets. Post-rule, you can process targets at the end. So this is not very exciting. This would just show the output once at the very end of the script. So if we go to a, another type, say a host rule, now the action is actually going to get a host. I think that's what it is. And now I'll see the script run once for each host. Okay. And it does run after all the scans for that particular host have been run. And then the final rule is uh, port rule. And this is where most of your scripts will be. They'll, uh, you'll want to run them on a particular port. We get another argument. Oops. Okay, and you see the script is getting run for each port. All right, so not that useful. So now, so for a, a real script, uh, so. My example here is suppose I came across something like this. Right? So I have a private SSH key here. And I want to uh, test it out. But to use this key, I still have to know a user. Right? So I'm going to create a user list. Right? Now I'm going to write a Nmap script that's going to try that key for all the users for every machine that I find that has port 22 open, right? So that's something that you could do manually, but 
this the script for it is is very easy. Uh, well, I'll show you it, I'll show you it in action first. Uh, so I'm just gonna limit us to port 22, so I don't have to it'll go faster. I need some arguments for my script. Uh, and this is the output of my script. They found that that key worked for user Evan on two of the machines. Right, so that's kind of cool, uh, particularly because the script is so short. Right, there's really nothing to it. I collect two arguments. I just do some basic checks to make sure they're not null, and then this this is just basic Lua stuff. Open a file, and then I just loop through it. And this is where those libraries come in handy. I don't have to worry about the SSH connection. Uh, that's handled by this library utility. And there's even a call, you know, I can give it a public key and a user and say, go try it. And if it opens up, then I just add my entry to a table that I'm maintaining. And that's what's going to be output. So, uh, do I have time for one more or do I, should I pass it on? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> So, here's another service that's running that has not been correctly identified by Nmap, right? So, my machine, I obviously know what's running there. What's running there is, is a vault server, right? Uh, there's no detection for that right now in uh, Nmap. So, what I would like to see happen is... to show up like that, right? I was going to do a little bit more involved and actually get the the uh, version number off of it, but it's in JavaScript and it's freaking obfuscated JavaScript. And I just didn't want to go through the hassle of doing that right now just for this demo. But again, what's if we look at this, You see that it doesn't directly go there. There's a redirect if you just go to the, uh, the root of that thing. In my script, I don't have to worry about that. Uh, so if, you know, if I go to the redirect, I do get a head and stuff like that. But in my script, all I have to do is call it on the root directory because the HTTP library in the NSC libs will handle the redirects for me automatically. Again, those all the libraries in that NSC live, uh, they do a lot of work for you. So you can actually write very simple scripts, right? And see here, all I'm doing is just string match on the page as if I some, find something with vault in it. So anyway, I've been using, I've been writing a lot of MMAP scripts lately. Uh, I think it's pretty cool what you can do with them and just wanted to share. That's very cool, Scott. You know, uh, if if someone here wanted to, you know, give give this a try, you know, is there any resources you uh, any resources you'd recommend they get started with? I'll share a couple of books that I've been re uh, using, but really, mm -hmm. it's it's like most programming, right? There's like 600 examples in that Nmap script directory, and then there's mm -hmm. 150 or so libraries. Just take one that does something similar to what you want to do. And, and go from there. That's yeah. that's my advice. Makes a lot of sense. But I, I will post some links to some books that I have used. Awesome. 
Do we have any questions for Scott? Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to say it's cool. Um, you know, I agree with you. Like, there's always too many code examples for things, and having like a skeleton script, like what you had in the beginning, is great. Like a hello world. Um, I had the same experience when I'm, I'm working in AppSec right now. So I use a lot of like Burp Suite, and I didn't use Intruder a lot. And then it turned out there was a plugin called Turbo Intruder, and you can actually script the um, intruder and actually do the thing that I wanted to do. And obviously it's a different application than SSH and, you know, but it was the same idea. It was like, they had an example that was a basic bare bones example that was enough to get going and it was awesome. So that's good to see, thank you. Yeah. So one of the things uh, that people are using NMAP for a lot now is brute forcing passwords. And there's a, there's a whole uh, set of classes to facilitate uh, brute forcing a custom, writing a brute force, a custom brute force uh, script. And there's a plenty of examples for that inside of the NMAP scripts lab, but that's pretty cool. Scott May, this is James May. Ask why you're so interested in NMAP right now? Uh, well, so I, I do some auditing of stuff where I work and it's network traffic that I'm looking at and identifying services. And I've just, I just found it easy to automate some of the work I'm doing with NMAP instead of, uh, yeah, bringing up Wireshark or something, bringing up TCP dump and stuff. Instead of looking for things, I have NMAP go out and find them for me. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. Very cool. I like I like your laziness, Scott. <laughs> I can appreciate that. Um, all right. Uh, any other questions for Scott while we have him with us at this moment? All right. So we'll probably move on to our next uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Scott. That was really great. I know a few folks joined during the middle of uh, uh, Scott's presentation. So uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, so I was thinking, Chris, would you be able to go next? Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to toss it over to Chris. He's going to be talking about pivoting to me. So thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ben. And thanks, DC207, for having me again. Um, I took the whole time, hogged the whole thing in December, and, uh, and that was a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm happy to do just a shorter session this time. Um, so cheat sheets, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, if you can see behind me, I've got my, my bulletin board with of course, strong bad in the middle there. And then cheat sheets, everything from, you know, packet headers to HTTP status codes um, to actually one cheat sheet that we're going to be going through tonight. If you ever need to, need to find one for a particular thing, just Google SANS cheat sheets. And there are a bunch of them just, just for free up on their site and in all realms of security, including, you know, forensics and management. Uh, and of course, oh yeah, some cloud things now, that's the new cool, right? And one of them is this handy dandy little pivot cheat sheet. And that's what I'm gonna be diving through today. So it's it's designed to be like a like a trifold piece of paper. Uh, back in the days when we went to classes, you might get handed this, this piece of paper. Now it's just a, a PDF and that's fine. Um, and the way it's the, the way it's set up is to to kind of give this an intro on what would be the, the front cover. And then on the inside, talk about uh, some very uh, some common ways of, of doing different pivots, and then on the back there's some more information. Now, um, so I think everybody probably knows what pivoting is, but just just to cover real quick, in a lot of cases, um, attackers or, or honestly even sysadmins need a way to get from one system to another, uh, you know, via whatever route. And there are so many ways to do it, and they're all a little different. They all have their quirks, uh, and and I wanted like a, a single place to be able to find these kind of uh, techniques. So. Um, so I, I put this together and uh, it uses some, some built-in tools like SSH, uses some common attacker tools like Meterpreter, part of, part of the Metasploit framework. Um, it even talks you how to do it with NetSH, which is native to uh, the Windows terminal. So um, lots of different options there. So, uh, so for example, so the way the way this is set up is, you know, let's say we are an attacker. Our our domain, our our, our host name is attacker.tgt. 
we can reach pivot.tgt, uh, we can't reach victim.tgt, and that's where we want to get. So, uh, so that's the context for how each of these is written up. So, uh, for example, we will look first at the SSH local port forward. So let's say that, if I can get my right term, no, it'll be the last one. All right, so let's say I've got, um, I've got access to uh, one machine. Let's say I can SSH to uh, 1030, oops, 36.1.8. Of course, it's harder to type when people are watching. So here we go. I can, I can get to, to that machine from where I'm at, but let's say I can't get to uh, the dot four machine, but I know that the dot eight can get there. So what we can do here is use the sheet to see, um, we can use this local port forward. So I'm gonna copy here what we're doing. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do an SSH connection and then some switches here uh, to background it and to make it uh, do this local port forward thing. I'm gonna open up port 1337 on my machine because pen tester, I have to use port 1337. That's, that's actually in, in uh, nerd law. And that I want it to end up going to instead of victim.tgt, in my case, that is 1.4 on SSH port 22. So uh, dear SSH, this is where I'd like to get. I'd like to open up a port on my local machine that'll reach to port 22 on, on the victim. And I wanna do that via uh, this other machine that I know I can already reach. So I do this, put my SSH key in again. And now if you see, I'm still, I'm still at where I was. Um, by the way, this is, a, this is one I learned very recently. IP, a lot of, you can use IP adder to get your IP address and lots of information. But if you, if you IP and then just BR, I'm guessing that's for brief or something, you get it a lot shorter, a lot smaller output. Um, so we can see, oh, I got the made up. Uh, I'm, I'm in uh, WSL, so I've got like my, my pretend IP address. Uh, that's fine. Either way, I'm still on my host, right? So I, I made that SSH connection. And in fact, if I look through my, my list of connections, I can see I've got an active connection to, uh, to that pivot machine, to dot eight. Um, I already do have a connection to dot four, but just, just pretend you don't see that. Just pretend you don't see that, okay. To get there now, I wanna, I wanna connect to that distant machine. So I'm gonna give a username that's gonna work on my victim, work on that, that far end, but I'm not gonna connect uh, directly to it. I'm gonna connect to that port that I opened up on my own machine, which was, or, one, three, three, seven. So we'll do this. It's going to connect back to me. It doesn't recognize the fingerprint because it's not used to seeing uh, that host key on 127.001. So now here I am on 136.14. So to go back through. So what happened was I connected to that the dot eight machine. I opened up port 1337 on my local box. And then when I SSH to that, to myself on that, on that uh, port, it's gonna ride through the SSH connection I already have in the pivot and create a new SSH uh, connection to the target. Now, as, as a defender, this can be a really hard thing to see depending on how you're monitoring net flows because you have a legit connection, a normal SSH connection from you know, outside internet to this machine that's in your DMZ or wherever. And that you, you have open to SSH because you know business reasons. Uh, and then maybe it's normal for that machine to SSH further into this, this dot four machine. Um, and it's they're separate connections, right? If you're looking at your at your logs, your Splunk, uh, Netflow, whatever it is, you'll see this one connection and this other connection. There's there's nothing that logically ties them together, uh, unless you're doing some some fancier uh, checking. So uh, it can be kind of a sneaky thing. Um, but there it is. That was one of the pivots. Um, I now want to show. Oh, any questions by the way on local port forwarding, or the or the pivot sheet in general? or whether or not pivoting is good for your health. Of course it is. Okay. <laughs> so hey, one Chris, more Chris, just one, yeah. one question. It didn't look like you were using any tools. You're just using native, native functionality. Is that, did I miss anything? No, you are exactly correct. That's native functionality. Okay. And, and in lots of cases, that's all we get, right? Like if you're, if you're doing a pen test and you land on somebody's box, they may not have Nmap installed. They may not have, you may not be able to put a meterpreter shell on there because of antivirus or whatever. So 
Um, so I, I made sure to put as many native tools on this uh, on the sheet as possible. Uh, one more that I think is fun because again, it uses native tools that are usually there on, on Linux in one form or another. And this is a Netcat um, uh, port forward proxy thing. Um, so I've got I've got machine I've got dot eight here, I've got dot four uh, yeah I'm on yeah dot four here, and then let's say that they can both get to dot nine so message and oops again it's always harder when people are watching ten dot thirty six dot one dot nine. So, so I'm on dot nine. So three, sep three separate machines. Uh, we're gonna use a little trick here in Linux uh, where we're gonna make a named pipe. Most things in Linux are, are viewed as a file, whether they are or not. If it's a directory, if it's a process, uh, whatever, you, you can generally find it in the file system. So backpipe here is, is a zero byte um, FIFO. It's a, it's a named pipe that we can use to send traffic through. Um, and we'll show why that's important in just a second here. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead on this middle machine that the other two machines can both reach. They can't reach each other, but they can both reach this middle machine. On this middle machine, I'm going to listen, uh, verbosely on port, uh, let's say 6,000. And then when I connect to it, I want to pass that traffic forward to uh, one dot four to this this distant machine over here. Snoopy, if you're curious, is my um, uh, my security onion server. Uh, oh yeah, let's say that's on eight thousand. So Snoopy's gonna be over here listening on eight thousand. By the way, Netcat is just a wonderful tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it it's it's a very low level. Um, just networking uh, jackknife. It's like a Leatherman that can do all kinds of crazy things. And uh, 36.1.9 on, what was it, 6,000? Okay, so um, my machine on the left here reached the machine in the middle, which reached the machine at the far end there. So now when I put something in here, like hello, it leaves this Netcat client, reaches this Netcat server, and then is piped through to the its Netcat client to this Netcat server, and there's the hello. So pretty cool. So these machines don't have a connection to each other. So again, if you're looking at NetFlow, if you're looking at whatever, you're not gonna see a connection from the dot eight to the dot four. You'll just see two separate connections, two otherwise unrelated connections to dot eight. Um, however, this is not perfect because this netcat server when it sends standard out back it's going to hit this netcat client and then dump out to the terminal so we don't get uh we don't get the full connection forward and backward so maybe it's not super useful depending on what you're trying to do so let's tear it down we're going to listen again here on the far end on the middle here we're going to add another piece we're going to bring in the back pipe so not the bagpipe, the backpipe. Uh, we're gonna send things that come out of this Netcat client through backpipe. And backpipe isn't a file. It can't just hang on to that stuff. It needs to go somewhere. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use, this is a, a shortcut uh, for standard in. We're gonna say, hey, whatever comes out through standard out to this backpipe, I wanna send back through to standard in of this other Netcat process, which should hopefully bring it back over here. So we'll, we'll talk through that again in just a second because there's a lot going on. Try number two. So I've got my little Netcat chat going on here. I send it through this Netcat client to this server listening on 6000. It is then going to come out of standard out for this app through the pipe into this Netcat client to the other machine. And sure enough, we get try number two landing at this Netcat server. Now, send it back. When you learn to teach labs and do demos uh, for, for groups like SANS, they tell you never, never to say, this is what happens next. You say, watch this, because you don't know exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to work. So watch this. It made it back. So you see now, none of the output is landing here in the middle. It's all going back and forth between these two distant endpoints. 
Um, and one more time, how that's working here is, is we've got the one connected to uh, here in the middle. And then just by virtue of how things flow, right, standard out from this gets piped through into standard in of this, which comes over here and lands on the terminal. And then when we send things back, standard in of this is the standard out of this, which we are redirecting to backpipe. Backpipe very helpfully and instantly sends anything that it gets back to standard in of the first one, which then lands back on that left terminal. So why is this handy? Um, I've used this before uh, when uh, when I was at work. This was this wasn't at Sage. This was at somewhere else. Uh, wasn't it Tyler? Uh, where I had my personal computer on the Wi-Fi, I had my work computer on the work network, and I needed to push files back and forth. And email is slow and kludgy and dumb, and uh, sometimes you just can't use it. So. If I had like a Google Cloud or a, or a, or a DigitalOcean droplet or an AWS instance, right? Uh, if I had one of those here, then uh, they could both reach that because it's got a public IP address, even though mine are, uh, the other two machines are both NATed. So they can't address each other directly. It's just not going to happen, but they can both reach this uh, Google Cloud instance and, and pass files back and forth. Also very, ha uh, very handy on pen tests, handy uh, moving files around a network if you've got uh, restrictions. Um, that's kind of a lot. Uh, that, and that one is, by the way, explained here on the cheat sheet in this bottom section right there, the netcat port forward. I'd like to show one more quick thing if I can. Any questions on the, on the backpipe port forward before we do that last one? You're explaining it just so clearly. No one has any questions. <laughs> Sure, we're all <laughs> fast asleep. Um, so I'm gonna do one more thing here. And this is something anybody who's ever played uh, Hack the Box or done time in the OSCP labs uh, has, has faced where you get a shell and it's ugly. And uh, and it's it's workable, but it's just kind of weird. So this is 10, uh, 36. And what I'm representing here is that I got some kind of code execution on this target and I told it, hey, set up a netcat listener. And when somebody connects to you, hand that client uh, control of this program called bin slash sh. So give them a shell. So here I am here interacting over netcat with this shell and I can do things, right? I can issue commands and get things back and that's awesome. My favorite IP command there. Uh, but it's an ugly terminal. Like I don't get a prompt. I can't do fun things. Well, Yay, on this, on the back of this, if you folded it up, um, we have a few different ways to upgrade ugly shells and we get to pick one. So I'm gonna pick the Python one because I like Python. And, and you may have seen this before, but now I've got like a much nicer looking prompt, right? That's a lot nicer. I still can't use like up arrow and stuff though. Guess what? There's a hack for that too. The next block down on there tells us we can control Z to background that application. And then I'm going to be real, real honest here and tell you, I don't know exactly what these next commands do, but they work and that is good enough for me. So uh, I did some stuff there. I'm going to export a couple of variables and set the TTY size, paste anyway. And now I can still do those things. Can I up arrow? Now I can up arrow. So I can, I can, it's like a real bash prompt now or, uh, or shell anyway, um, that will even do all the colors uh, as much as you want. So uh, so again, that was just one more thing on the sheet there, uh, upgrading ugly shells and then further upgrading ugly shells to get them to work a lot nicer. Um, I hope if anyone's gonna do the uh, pendicing with Cali or, or anything like that, that that's helpful to you. I think that would have been would have been nicer for me. Okay, my I'm at my time. Happy to answer any questions people have about pivoting or cheat sheets or lolcat. That's really cool stuff. Thanks. Yeah, that was what I think. Wow, was my uh, you did all that without tools? Yeah, that's yep. that's cool. He had Netcat, which is installed, you know, on Amazon Linux, you know, <laughs> by default, <laughs> and most it, cloud operating systems, right? <laughs> Right, and now in places like, uh, or now in like Windows 10, you get things like SSH built right in. So it's, you know, the tools are getting around and it's it's nice. Yeah, very cool. I, I'm gonna actually grab that 
um, that, 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 uh, that sheet because I find myself every time I'm in like an ugly shell, I just have to Google that Python bit. I, you know, like every single time, like I just, I don't remember what it is. So um, I'm gonna have to grab that. So I have it just real handy. Maybe I'll put it to memory someday. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm right with you. Every time I have to look it up and that's why it's over there on my, on my wall. And every time I look at it, I go, I, I should know that. That's, it's a single, <laughs> simple one-liner and I don't, I don't know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Chris? Uh, there's claps, awesome presentation, <laughs> great explanations. Yeah, this is a really good, clear explanation on pivoting. I, I think you took a really complex topic which is, you know, networking's hard, right? Uh, at least for a lot of people um, and, and explain it well. So thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for letting me steal your airwaves again. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for coming. <laughs> so um, we have just one more presentation this evening. Uh, we've got Ben, uh, who's gonna be talking about, uh, oh, uh, Justin says, do you recommend any flavor of raspberry pie for network testing like this? Um. No. <laughs> <laughs> I like the newer ones. They have more RAM. Uh, <laughs> oh, I should point out too, at the, at the top of that, that column on, on, with the SSH port forwarding, there's a specific setting you have to configure in the SSHD uh, settings, but it's, it's on the sheet there. Um, so if you're trying that and it's not working, just go to the top of that column and it, it tells you how to enable gateway ports. So that's that's one key there. But yeah, you can turn that on in any version of, of Raspbian or uh, I think it's Raspberry Pi OS now. Very cool. I did have one quick question. Oh, have you ever had to do something where you've done multiple layers of pivoting? Um, I know I've done it. I don't know if I had to, <laughs> but yeah. So so sometimes sometimes uh, you can, and, and hopefully it's easy, right? Like in a, in the best case, uh, you you can just SSH to the first one, SSH from there to the next one, and SSH to the last one, and you don't have to do anything fancy. Like that's that's a nice way to be. Um, you can't quite do the same thing with Enter PS session in, in PowerShell because of the way it, it passes creds. You got to be a little little fancier there, but. Um, but yeah, there, there may be times when you have to do that. Most people honestly don't segment their networks so thoroughly that that kind of thing is required, but, um, but it can come up, yeah. Uh, Curtis is asking, suppose the cheat sheet doesn't immediately give us the secret. Um, <laughs> uh, do you have a, a exercise or a lab environment that you suggest for practice? Uh, yes, and I'll answer it in the chat because I need to find it, but one of the, um, before I before I was on the team, one of the uh, holiday hacks had a pivot. It was one of the first things you had to do was was pivot into this other environment and then do a thing. Um, uh, for for my purposes, I'm I'm usually just happy bouncing around between my my pie holes and and my uh, security on uh, server. But uh, yeah, let me find that Curtis and I'll I'll post that in the chat. That's awesome, Chris. I I remember when I first started kind of playing with pivoting, I had to just set up like a my own lab stuff, and that was always a uh, Kind of a, a pain. So um, any any environments to make that easier, I'm sure, is helpful. I agree. Yeah. Do you hear that, Husky hackers? The holiday hack says Josh. <laughs> it's free. <All> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's free. It's awesome. <laughs> and there's a we had a presentation on it last month, which is now on our YouTube channel. If you ever want to go back and look at that, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Ben. Uh, ben, are you still with us? I sure am. Hi, awesome. everybody. Let me uh, share off my VM here. And you're going to be talking share about button. malware analysis with us today, right? Yep. Okay. So I am here to kind of, uh, I'm, I'm calling a show and tell uh, of a malware sample I've been working on lately. Um, this kind of comes about, I'm doing a course called uh, Zero to Automated. It's a fantastic uh, course on working through kind of a, some, I'd say level two, 201 level malware analysis and reverse engineering. So if you're interested, I can shoot that information out there for anyone who's actually interested in uh, looking at into this sort of thing. So um, 
let me dive in here. So I'm going to uh, play this video while I'm talking to kind of show what this sample does. It's uh, called the, the Revil malware. Hopefully this isn't uh, this video through a VM through a Zoom isn't uh, too terrible here. Um, but uh, the sample, it's, it's a uh, piece of ransomware. So uh, it's going through right now, executing, doing its job. And in about a minute here, you see all the files here change, uh, extension change on them, background changed. And oh crap, uh, we've been ransomed here. Uh, we, uh, in about a couple seconds here, we'll find uh, the ransom note on my desktop or the desktop of this sandbox I'm using. Uh, it's a service I, I like. It works pretty well called AnyRun. So if you ever have a piece of malware or what you think is malware that you want to see what happens, great tool to just basically plop in that uh, executable and it runs it uh, as long as there's no... Uh, anti-VM or any of that kind of stuff in the sample, it'll just run and you'll see what happens. And in this case, it encrypted a whole bunch of files um, and dropped a ransom note. So this is all well and good, but how does it do this? Like there's, a, there's actually a whole lot to this, uh, this sample here. And we're gonna take a, a little bit of kind of deeper dive into uh, the reversing of this sample. Um, and I guess to, to, to plug my, uh, my own stuff here, uh, I've started a series of blog posts on my blog uh, about the sample so I can write it up and get a little more detail out there. Uh, so uh, uh, benmason.space is the easiest way to get there. Um, um, so to, let's talk about a little bit more here. So there's what I'm gonna call two stages to this malware. First, there's the first stage, which is uh, an executable that contains, well, the second stage, which actually does the real work here. Um, it is set up like this so that um, it hides the kind of valuable piece, the actual encryption piece, the piece that does all the hard work inside another executable that can get easily burned. Maybe it hides uh, what is going on and obscures it in some way or another. Um, often this is called packing of a piece of malware. And you can see in this little little picture here, you run the program, it uses, uh, sets up the RC4 encryption, it decrypts the payload, puts it into memory and runs it. So let's take, let me uh, pop over to uh, another tool here called Item. Um, anyone who has seen me talk about this stuff before, because this ain't my first rodeo, talking to you all about malware and reverse engineering. Um, I'm using a different tool this time around, it's called Ida. It's a, a disassembler and a decompiler. It does the same thing as what you may have seen me use before, Gidra. Just that one's free. Uh, this one's a pay tool, uh, but it's uh, kind of one of the main uh, industry standard ones. So I've been starting to kind of get my arms around it and how to use it and get kind of more skilled around uh, using Ida. Um, so I, I've done a lot of work and a lot of markup on this. So I'll point out kind of stuff that I put names to usually uh, initially when Ida does an analysis, it will name uh, functions or a different code uh, sub and then the uh, underscore and then the virtual memory address of that piece of code. Um, so let's let's talk about this. When I first open up, it starts at start, and that's um, what's called the entry point, which is the place in memory that things start off in. Uh, with the uh, the program here. Uh, and so uh, we will go in and the first function that it runs here, I named it MW main or W main. Uh, it's the main function. Uh, anyone who's looked at a C program, thought about a C program, main function is the first function that does all the hard work in it. Uh, Windows usually calls it W main if it's gonna be a, a kind of command line type of application. So I just double clicked on it and looked at our first chunk of code here. Um, and this kind of goes through some of that flow that I just had in that diagram. So uh, I name a lot of functions that are main malware functions starting with MW. It's a, it's a tip I kind of picked up to help chunk them together into, into the list here and make it a little bit easier to find each of the, the malware functions here that may not have been identified by IDA itself. Um, so what this does, it takes this, what's a key that's stored in memory, 
copies it into a variable. And then uh, this function that I frankly didn't bother naming here uh, does more setup to the encryption and gets it kind of a little more prepared. And uh, if you're uh, not going to dive deep into RC4 encryption, but it has a couple things where it sets up the, the basically the, it's called a box, which is the kind of key data that it uses to do the decryption. And then next, uh, this next function does act the, the actual decryption. And it's just a little while loop here that does a little bit of math against the box. I'm sure, uh, 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 I'm sure there's some cringing out there from Scott, uh, me poorly describing RC4 encryption as I know he's uh, uh, big into encryption, but uh, I'll, I'm trying to simplify it a little bit. Um, but the interesting part about this, you see kind of often with a function, you pass in the data to the function that you want to do it. This actually has a pointer based into it that is the location of the encrypted location that holds the data for the second stage. And it's this whole big string of gobbledygook here you see on uh, the left side here. And so this is all a whole bunch of hex, just data that it uses. And then it goes through, it decrypts it, um, and it'll pop out. And another big piece here is, as opposed to say, taking this data and, and, and writing it to a file on the hard drive, most, a lot of malware these days doesn't actually write anything to disk anymore necessarily, unless you put it there yourself. Uh, it's a great way to, to not writing to disk is a great way to hide and obscure your malware as AV won't detect it. AV won't find it if it's not on disk, unless you're use, using kind of advanced endpoint protection or something that, that actually uh, pays attention to uh, the behavior of things on your computer. Um, but so some of the kind of key pieces and parts to this, uh, you see here, it, what this does is it sets up a couple, finds a couple of Windows native functions. Um, they kind of say what they do. This allocates memory, puts it, uh, and then uh, this function allocates memory, and then this function writes data to memory. So it finds those functions that Windows has internally, uh, it does a few things to it. Uh, my headset just told me that my battery's low, which is going to be great. Hopefully, uh, it'll last throughout the rest of this talk here. Um, so if I magically disappear, it's because my battery died. I've been on the phone all day. Um, but so next, uh, after those uh, functions are found, it goes through and allocates a chunk of memory that is uh, the size a certain size, which is the size of the data of the second stage, then it goes through and writes it. So it takes this payload data that we had decrypted, writes it into memory. And then if we scroll a little bit farther down, eventually my mouse wheel will work. A couple other little bits and pieces. We, um, where is it at in here? Somewhere in here, ah, uh, in here we make a call to that memory. There we are. So we make a, a call to that place in memory, which takes us to the part that does all the real work. So this whole thing I just went through, essentially just takes a bunch of data, decrypts it, and puts it into RAM to then run it and do all the hard work of stealing and, well, not stealing in this case, but encrypting all, uh, all the data on the hard drive, or at least the actual data data on the hard drive. So, uh, now let's take a look at the, the second stage. And I'm gonna, there's a whole lot to this. I'm gonna highlight a couple specific things about it that really is the hard work of this encryption here. Um, and here's another, another lovely flow chart that I put together where uh, it pops into the program and it resolves the import table. Um, and so but for anyone who's not really familiar with binaries and Windows programs, um, the import table basically takes all the native Windows like DLL files. So everyone probably seen a DLL file if you've done something with a Windows program that whole, has a whole bunch of functions in it. And what that does is it takes those DLL files that it uses, pops them and loads them into memory and finds the functions like the write memory function, the copy data function, the encrypt your files function or encryption functions. Uh, and finds them in memory 
to uh, use them later in the program. So it gets that all sets up, set up, and it looks to see, oh, am I already running? Do you, do, do you, do you see, do I see myself already running? Oh, if I do, I, it exits out, or then it goes through really all, all the rest of it and keeps going to do a couple privilege escalations with uh, changing to the, the run as, uh, or impersonating as the user of explorer.exe if it needs to, loads uh, its own configuration. Like any other piece of software, it actually has a whole ton of configuration, various options it uses to do different things based on the configuration. And then finally, after it sets up all kinds of configuration, it uh, starts uh, deleting some content basically and or encrypting all your files and setting up all of uh, changing your background. And well, there we saw what it did in the end. So with that, let's pop back over to Ida real quick here. And so I, uh, this is probably in a weird spot because I've just been doing slowly reworking through all my analysis here. Um, but we're, we here are in our main function again, um, which does that initial setup I was talking about with resolving the libraries. Uh, it then does the privilege escalation if it's not running goes into the main malware process and then does a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> um, but what I will dive in quickly to here is, uh, well, two things that I find super interesting. Um, so here's the main encryption function, which if you're ever looking, uh, if looking at this first, well, it's finds the command line arguments because you can run this with specific command line arguments and it does different things. Again, it's like any other piece of software. They have a lot of very interesting functionality in this program here. Um, but let's find down here. So that's, oh, come on, it's being slow. So this whole chunk of code here, um, I'll talk a little bit kind of how I figured out what's going on here. Because when you first, um, open this up in, in, in really any any reverse engineering tool, it doesn't look anything like this. It's a whole lot of like obscure values. It looks like some of this might be an array. There's a lot you have to kind of figure out about what this is doing and set variable types. Figure out kind of make a best guess of what things really are and just start naming things. Um, so this, whole variable section here, A2. Um, this, when you first open up, just looks like kind of a list of things. It just has a very couple memory addresses uh, and, and it kind of guessed it was what would be like an array or a list or you know, depending on what they call it in the programming language that you're most familiar with. Um, and after looking, I'm like, there's a lot of commonality here um, and it probably is a structure, it's like main data set of things that are common to it. Um, so I wrote up a structure, which I can find, do I have that window open? I don't. So I'll not dive too deep into that one. Um, but yeah, so it's a whole set, a whole structure of data that are used to find the program files return file name extensions. And you can see kind of my um, flippant way of naming things. And I don't quite know what it is. I just put something in it. Uh, and it just, I think it's that, it does something like that. Um, but then finally, uh, well, it uh, calls uh, the write encrypted file buffer to disk. Um, and so that is one of that, between that and the run uh, cryptor are the two functions that uh, do the dirty work here. Uh, so let me make sure I'm looking at the right function. So this function I just looked into essentially takes data. It calls a write file function, the write file function and closes the handle. So this literally just writes data to disk. But the dirt, um, there we go. Uh, so this function here is the run cryptor, which is actually what does the encryption. And so it takes in uh, some file information, a path, and then inside of here, again, it, it opens, basically it opens up the file. I didn't mean to do that, sorry about that. Uh, it opens up the file, 
sets a pointer to it, it reads some data from the file. It does a checksum on the file. Um, but, and if uh, that checksum goes a certain way, it jumps, it, it dumps out. Now, uh, usually when you see something, when it does a checksum on a file or a checksum on something, usually it ha it'll look to see if it's uh, a file that it doesn't want to encrypt or doesn't want to do something with that. Uh, and you, sometimes that's meant to just skip the file, skip something to be obscure, to hide itself and do a little, uh, little work around to hide, to be a little more stealthy here. But if we keep scrolling down here, you see a little bit more create file, create file. Again, it's just looking at the file and then where functions in here somewhere that I named it as I, you can see me leaning in, uh, which is uh, usually muttering and leaning in are my uh, reverse engineering tool sets. Oh, so that's what it is. Um, I just have to remember where it is. So somewhere in here that I am, it's not jumping out at me, uh, is where it jumps in and runs the encryptor. I feel like I'm having uh, the demo gods fail at me right now uh, because they are. So we'll jump back out a couple steps here. And that's what it, okay. <laughs> that's why this is a pain in the butt. So, uh, that fun all this data that we just kind of went through that has a couple different functions that do the encryption and writing files to that get set into a, another function that uh, essentially goes through and searches file systems. So you can see this is a lot of like onions deep. It's a little tricky to explain um, from like how nested all of these, this functionality is. Um, and they do a lot of this nesting of functionality to both be obscure, to, again, make it complicated to talk about, complicated to describe, but also keeps it modular um, so that I can, uh, me as a, as a malware author, I can take out pieces and parts of code that are in this functionality and say, oh, I might want to change what kind of encryption it uses. And I just essentially would write in a whole new function to this program and change one variable or change maybe what uh, would be a constant variable in the program and switch out to be, maybe I don't use, uh, this uses AES encryption to encrypt the files. I would use something like Blowfish or some other more hardened encryption. Um, and it's, it's always kind of funny and amazing to me that when you, you know, as I look more deeply into various pieces of malware and various programs like this, um, the, especially the more advanced functionality, uh, general software development techniques are used in programs like this to keep functionality, keep malware, keep it mechanical. Um, this has a whole section that is just the configuration. Uh, and it's a basic configuration file in memory. It's encrypted, but it's probably written there by a build work stream. So any of anyone who does software development on a regular basis, they probably have a CI CD workflow that goes through and takes a JSON configuration file and encodes it, obscures it, but then writes it in as part of the file so that it can load back up and be changed, manipulated for every single campaign and make it look different with every single campaign. And so there's a whole lot more I could talk about about the sample. It's pretty long. I have uh, a blog post that went up this morning. One's coming out next week, the same time, and then probably a couple more afterwards, diving more deeply into some of the specific functionality. Um, it's a super interesting uh, piece of malware, super interesting sample, and uh, looking at how criminals encrypt your files and want to take your money. Uh, but it's a it's a fun fun sample. So I think uh, I've used up uh, probably my 15 minutes, if not a little bit more here. So I'll uh, open up for more questions. Uh, if there's anything specific you want me to circle back with, I'm happy to take another quick look at any parts here. So so I have a question, Ben. Um, yep. You know, I, I think probably not not everyone here is super familiar with <laughs> uh, disassembling things and uh, you know looking at them in Ida or you know Ghidra. You know, if someone wanted to start getting familiar with these kinds of tool sets, you know, is there something that you'd recommend uh, that they they check out? Um, you know, 
your blog is probably a good place to, you know, get some knowledge, of course, but is there anything that kind of like helped you kind of explore this and become fascinated with like the inner workings of this malware and, and, and kind of pulling apart the bits and pieces and making, making something of it? Yeah. So, so um, first I'll just describe briefly my inspiration uh, to getting into RE and malware. And it is just actually what you just said, Ben. Me, even as a child, love to take things apart and see how they worked. Like that's that's my inspiration here. Um, getting into software reverse engineering, um, getting understanding a little bit about uh, forward engineering is super helpful. So learning to write a little bit of C code, learning to just, you don't have to be an expert at anything. You should probably don't really want to be an expert at any specific piece, but you should understand a little bit about forward engineering before you start to, um, say, look at a piece of unknown malware uh, that you have in front of you. But a really great um, book that I recommend is a practical malware uh, reverse engineering. It's the, yeah, it's the a practical malware analysis, sorry. Uh, it's the red book. I just looked at it on my bookshelf over there, um, uh, somewhere in the matrix over here. Uh, but uh, it's a great book to get started looking at, at malware reverse engineering. It's, it's approachable. Um, also, um, there's a lot of um, CTFs. Uh, they're called crack me's usually in this in this realm. In this realm, but it's a they're CTF style thing where it's just uh, it, some of them are very simple, some of them are very easy, um, and that kind of gets you the basics of saying, "Hey, I have this unknown piece of mal uh, piece of software. It's usually benign. It's usually like find this password kind of stuff." Um, it's a great way to get started. Being like, "Hey, I got this this." This, uh, this little binary, let me throw it into uh, Adafruit or Kidra or any, there's a million programs, not a million, but there's a handful of programs that do this. And it gets you that practice of something that's not uh, a huge binary that has function list, a function list that looks like this, <laughs> uh, that you have to spend a whole lot of hours going through and marking up and figuring out how it works. Um, that's probably uh, some way, some places I would start. Uh, there's a ton of resources out there, um, you know, Googling how to become a reverse engineer, malware analysis is, is, is also like, there's a ton of resources and I can probably dump a whole bunch into uh, the, the main sec uh, chat. So I'll, 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 I'll tee up my plug here uh, for the mainsec.org uh, uh, Slack room. If you aren't on it already, I know a lot of people here are. Uh, mainsec.org and just to sign up there and get your self-service invite. Yeah, uh, I'll double plug that. So DC 207's most of the operations and like chat has moved over to mainsec. So if you're not a mainsec, uh, definitely, definitely uh, join up. Um, awesome, Ben. Uh, do we have any other questions for Ben this evening? Yeah, I have a question. Was this particular example, was it run through an obfuscator? Can you tell? I don't think it's run through a specific obfuscator. Um, I should say there were obfuscation routines, but it wasn't run through a specific obfuscator. Um, the, the quick aside there is um, this has a lot of string, like strings in this aren't a thing when you look, open it up at first. Uh, every string was also encrypted. So uh, that shows in a lot of the configuration routines where when it loads it up, it has to decrypt the strings that it's going to match in the configuration file before it can read that configuration. Um, also, the encryption key, is it specific? Does it like generate a new encryption key for each install? Or uh, nope, everything's, everything's relative. The sample, everything is relatively static. So if every time you look at the same sample, it's the same. Let me let me cycle that. Back. The encryption, the actual on disk encryption key is, uh, I believe, unique per victim. Okay. Um, the encryption keys based around in it are are not. Um, uh, it it use, so it uses so uh, uses it uses uh, AES. So it's using public private encryption. So I think it it's a it's it's a unique. It's the private key is signed. Let me let me remember this correctly. Uh, the the, pri the private decryption key, I think, is uh, relative. Is there's a base private key that is keyed to a public uh, public key that has. Uh, it's a little bit different between each victim. 
I'm, I'm describing that poorly. Uh, we can take that offline, Scott, if you want. I think that's going to take me a few more than- no, what, what I was going to get at is, would you be able to reverse it so that you could pull a key, a key out that you need to fix the, the victim? Uh, to, to, no, I don't, you, you, there's no, no key you can pull out of this to do the decryption. Okay. I have a question. Go ahead. Hi. Um, okay. So Ben, are you using any sort of custom disassembly pass for this? Because you said it's packed. So, or were you just using the disassembler that's in Ida? I was just using the disassembler in Ida. So to get the, the, the packed portion out, um, I did write a, a, uh, a Python script to um, essentially pull the data uh, to pull the data out of the binary, uh, the, out of the section in the binary that it exists. Uh, RC4 decrypted and dump it out to uh, a, a file on disk that I could then uh, do analysis on. So I don't do any custom disassembly. I just had a little script that does the uh, that pulls out the second stage. Or I think the first time I did it, I ran it in a debugger and just dumped the, the memory onto disk too. Cool. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about any run, kind of off. Yeah. Off. <laughs> um, so I was a little weirded out because when I went to use it, it kind of shows everything publicly. And then so, you know, anyone can come by and like rerun what happened on your machine. Uh, I noticed that you moved to Ida to show us some of the lower level assembly stuff. How much, how low level does it show on any run? Like it, I saw process names fly by and maybe file names. I wasn't sure. I'm actually kind of wondering about the security of any run at this point, like how you know what I mean? <laughs> how how much information does it store for everyone to see? Uh, so so any run uh, so every machine it runs is unique to that that run of the software of the the whatever piece of malware. So um, it's only the, from a data perspective, um, the only data leaked is anything that you upload to the tool. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. I there was a case of someone using their credentials on it, and I was like, ugh, because I know it also takes screenshots of it as you go, right? And I was just sort of horrified, but I wasn't sure if I should be horrified if it was just a tinfoil hat situation. So, yeah, if if, if it's uh, it's like any other public sandbox, if you up you upload your creds to it, it'll it'll put them out there to public. But yeah, otherwise it's otherwise there's no issues because it doesn't touch anything you don't give it. Oh. Um. And if you have money, it'll you can do private uploads too. But um, I, I I'm part of the the that zero to hero a zero to automated program. They do like a three month trial, but it still uh, doesn't give you allow you to do the private uploads. Good to know. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Nice. So there's so there's an API where someone could just like scrape any run. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. puts, oh, great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if I actually, let's see, I still have it open here. If I go here, public tasks, like here's, here's, here's uh, the last 50,000 uploads. So let's see if we can look at frozen, whatever frozen.exe is here, for example. Um, and yeah, here's, here's someone running whatever program this is. Some random stranger. Yep. Well, that's crazy. So Very cool. It, yeah, there's a ton. There's a. The, I like any run because it's really easy and they give you a lot of functionality for free. There's a bunch of other um, sandboxes out there, and one of my backlog projects is to set one up in my home lab. Um, a cook, a cuckoo is the is like one that's say uh, open source. You can build it up yourself uh, in a home lab. Um, I'm just haven't really spent the time to, to do it. Right on. Any other questions for Ben this evening? I guess not, Ben. That, thank Great. you so much. Thank you, ben. Yeah, it's oh. fascinating. Very yeah, interesting. I could talk for hours about this. So if any if one in the future wants to chat more about this kind of thing, I'm 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 happy to. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, that, that wraps it for tonight uh, for DC 207. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We, if you missed some of the talks, um, this will be uploaded on YouTube uh, sometime this weekend, and I'll post a link in the DC 207 chat room in MainSec. 
Um, mainsec.org is the uh, URL for the chat. I just posted that earlier um, in here. So uh, definitely join us if you haven't signed up already. Um, I did put out a call for presentations, uh, a pre pre call for presentations uh, for DC 207 throughout 2021. Um, I think a lot of folks probably know this already. I'm looking for content. If you guys are interested in presenting anything or have ideas for an event that you'd like to see at DC 207, uh, please hit me up. I'd love to talk with you and um, help build that out and make that happen. Um, that's all we have for tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to our presenters again, and um, have a great have a great month. We'll see you next month, hopefully. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye everybody. Thanks, bye. Ben. Have a great night. Bye bye.